Congratulations again. You have found another meta egg. Today we are being joined by actor Andras Jones. As far as we can tell, everything is working. Congratulations, everyone. We are here today to talk about Oscar uh, Isaac, the actor who played the lead in Moon Knight. I think it's inarguable that the only, well, one of the main reasons that uh, Moon Knight works the way it does is because the, the chemistry between Oscar Isaac and Oscar Isaac. Um, if you would. Just, and Oscar Isaac. And Oscar Isaac. The, all of the Oscar <laughs> Isaacs. All the, the many faces of Oscar Isaac. So if you'll just switch over. So it, it, we'll see if it works to where we can watch this trailer while we're talking to Andras. Can you see that, Andras? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can. So um, ho hopefully everything's working the way it wants to. I, I guess the the reason that you're here is because you're not only an actor, you're a film analyst for everybody who would like to keep current with the, the content that Andros is creating. He can find or you can find his podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. And the name of that podcast is The World is Wrong. Would you like to explain to us what that podcast is a little bit, Andras, if you don't mind real quick? Well, just look around you. The world is wrong. Uh, but in, in, in uh, about so many things. But in this case, it's about films. And uh, the World is Wrong podcast is a podcast I host with uh, a friend of mine, a director, and uh, just a big film fan named Brian Connolly. And it is an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists the world is wrong about. So the idea is that, I don't know, maybe you've seen a film before then you're, and uh, you heard it was horrible and you realize, wait a second, the world is wrong. This film is great. Or maybe there's a film you think you saw and you think this is great and then you realize that the world is wrong about it. Then you find yourself in a state where you need a podcast like ours to uh, find common cause with. and. Uh, every season, we come out with a show every week where we celebrate a different film. And uh, I guess probably some of them we'll be discussing here. Uh, what are you, what's a film you think the world is wrong about, Will? Well, I think, I mean, I hate to give a corny reference to Star Wars, but I think the world is wrong about a great many things. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I mean... I feel in terms like, of film, in terms of film, what's a film you think the world is wrong about? I, I, I'm I'm trying to riff onto a concept that's kind of abstract and hard to put into words, but I'm. I believe in you. You can do it. <laughs> the there's a I I reject the way that the algorithmic way um, people view content now only pushes what's current and what's out because i feel like we're in a time period where there's there's so many things that the world that the world has made and lie behind us like you, you just used uh, candy wrappers um and and that's why i like your i know i'm avoiding the question because that's a huge question i like watching or listening to your podcast with a pencil and pen to take notes because you've taught me there's so many movies that you guys watch and go over that um, that 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 came before me or that nobody told me about. However, one of the one of the episodes that I liked best about your series recently is uh, the Dune, the 1984. I think it was 84 Dune. Yeah. Um, one of Brian's choices, a film that he's very fond of. I'm not I, not fond of it, but every week we change. Who, who selects the film. So that, that's a Brian choice. I, to, to me, it was a good choice. I, th I feel like you're kind of wrong. You're part of the world being wrong about that movie. That I don't, yeah, I don't, that, that, you know, that's the whole ethos of the show. And I see some people talking about this, arguing about this in the chat of who's right and who's wrong. Basically, it's very simple. If you like it, you're right. If you right. don't like it, you're wrong. In terms of art, this is in terms of dating or in terms of politics, there's a lot of things you'd be right or wrong about. But when it comes to art, since no art has ever killed anybody and the only value in it is enjoyment, if you enjoy it, then you're right. And I'm curious about why you enjoy it. Even if I don't like it, there's something to be learned from like, okay, well, I found that very boring. What did you find interesting? And then maybe we have a conversation. I go back and I'm like, 
oh, now it's interesting to me because you clu- your liking it clued me in to what there is to like about it. And if you don't like about it, if you don't like a film, unless you're coming from a place of, I mean, there are certain places, like if we were making a movie and we were like, I, I hate this kind of movie, talking to the cinematographer, then they know what I mean. So that's useful. But in general, just the sort of like, that's a bad movie or that's a bad actor, I hate that. What 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 can what good can come of that conversation? And so that is our ethos, that if you don't like it, you're probably wrong because you're missing out on an opportunity to enjoy it. Because I don't know about you, but I can enjoy a lot of things that I don't really respect or love or think are even very good, but I could still find pleasure in it uh, if I have the right in. So, yes, I am definitely part of the world that, well, I was more wrong about Dune before I did my episode with Brian. Now I'm less wrong about it because I now have, a, I feel like I have a greater appreciation appreciation for it. I feel I, I'm I'm hoping that we're stepping into a time period where people go back and they view things that they've left behind. There's certain uh, movies that uh, I think kind of punctuate the that kind of zetgeist change. For instance, the new Spider-Man movie, where a lot of the movies that had been reboots in the past about Spider-Man, all of a sudden this new movie that came out has like sort of given them value. And there's a lot of, uh, I mean, Disney in particular is doing this with Star Wars as well. There's Obi-Wan Kenobi comes out in a few weeks, and that's that's an old story. That's a 40-year-old left-behind story that's getting new life. And, um, you know, speaking of Star Wars, it's interesting because I noticed a long time ago, if you go to, I, I'm, in, I'm a big nerd, big ner- movie nerd, and I have a lot of friends, and sometimes my friends would take me to go see the premiere of movies right when they came out uh, multiple times in one night. And I noticed that sometimes like the audience depends on how you receive the movie sometimes. So sometimes you might be in, have you noticed that? I mean. Oh yeah. I mean, it's less of a thing now because people don't go to movies as much, but there are definitely movies that, require an audience you know the marx brothers they used to make if you watch their movies without an audience they leave the time in it for the laughs because they were based on live shows so if you see it with an audience it works if you see it by yourself it seems kind of choppy because they give the laugh line and then they kind of the film kind of waits sonically for a few seconds a few beats and I mean, this. I mean, modern films are less like that. But then, I don't know. If, if you're familiar, are you familiar with the New Beverly Theater, the theater in Los Angeles that Quentin Tarantino owns? I, uh, I've heard you talk about it and discuss it a lot. Of course, I've never been to L.A., but they do double features, like old school double features. And if uh, they have a great podcast that comes out of there called uh, the Pure Cinema Podcast, and you listen every month, they go through the calendar and they'll talk about it and they'll be like, oh, well, this is a film that you got to see with an audience. If you've ever seen it by yourself, there's just like, it, it's true. There's a, there's just this audience reaction thing. And in some ways the films that people might think of as, I don't know, lowbrow or bad are a lot about getting this kind of reaction and charge from the audience. And so those films really benefit from that kind of thing. You know, there's such thing as like a good, bad movie, in my opinion. Yeah, well, we don't even believe that they're bad. It's like, if right. you like it, it's good. Yeah. I yeah. believe that, too. I've sort of painted myself into a corner as a researcher where I can make myself watch anything. And I don't. I think I'm numb to things being bad or good. However, I mean, you know, Twitter world and things like that, like I was mentioning earlier, the algorithmic world doesn't work that way. And sometimes modern things are torn to pieces very quickly before they even have a chance to, to germinate into a, a cult following or anything like that. Well, that was, um, what, that was one of the things that inspired our podcast was the film Mordecai. I absolutely, I loved, loved, I go crazy for that film. I think it's fantastic. I'm a big Johnny Depp fan. I know there's a lot of stuff in the news with him. Uh, but just as an actor, I'm a huge Johnny Depp fan. I came up with him, not like we know each other, but we dated some, some we dated the same people. We, we came up, we came up in Hollywood. And, 
in the, yeah, we were in the same, we were like in the same class in a large, co on a large college university. And um, so I used to feel a little bit competitive up. about him. And then I used, then I was just impressed with his talent over and over and over and over and over again. And I think Mordecai, Mordecai is one of the best things he's ever done because that kind of comedy that he's doing is some of the hardest stuff to do. And he just kills it. And people hated that film. It destroyed it, mocked it mercilessly. Fuck them. That film is so good. <laughs> Mordecai, the world is... They, even my co-host doesn't like it. I'm alone on an island. I think I've actually I met some friends. I had a, uh, someone who was in Johnny Depp's band, the band he moved out to L.A. with, recorded a song for me called Absolutely No Sense of Humor that you can find on uh, on YouTube and, and whatnot. And... Uh, and he was telling me that everyone in the Johnny Depp camp hates Mordecai. I was like, you're all wrong. I don't care. Even if Johnny hates it. He's wrong. Is it you and McGregor in that also? He's it... awesome in it. He's in it. Paul Bettany's in it. Oh, uh, Bettany's in it too? Uh, I get, and I, and, yeah, because uh, I, listening to the trial, I found out that Bettany and, and Depp are really good friends. Because they liked each other's sense of humor, so them being in a comedy together would be like, kind of exciting to see. I haven't, I know the movie, I haven't seen it. You though. gotta see it. It's so fucking funny. It so, really so speaking is of you and, and Depp being in the same class, you guys are almost colleagues because you're also like he is. You're a singer, songwriter, kids. actor ah. slash actor, and you started that before it was like a thing, really. I mean, that was like in the '80s. You were touring with your band the previous. Um, while you're acting. A lot of people said it was a stupid idea for you. Is that true? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, it, we all, I guess we all watched the trial. Johnny Depp was talking <laughs> about how once he became a movie star, he didn't feel like he could be a musician anymore. And definitely back in those days, there was the pull to be one or the other. Um, we, we so. know our subject matter, Oscar Isaac, I was reading up about him earlier today. He's a musician also. Well, yeah. Uh, I... He's in one of my favorite films about a musician inside Lewin Davis uh, from the Coen brothers. And I guess he was on, uh, he was on some talk show recently playing a song called the hippopotamus song, uh, which I, I took slight offense to because a friend of mine, Randy Kaplan wrote a great song uh, about a hippopotamus. Uh, it's clothed. It's name was very similar. That's a, a much more, uh, profound and complex song, but I sent it to my friend and he was like, who is that guy? So uh, I guess I, I think of Oscar Isaacs as being a very, very famous, successful actor, but I guess still a lot of people don't know who he is. Really weird. Well, I, we're going to change well, that now. Oscar Isaac, look, your things are looking up for you today. We're going to change all <laughs> that. People are gonna, after today, people are not going to stop saying who? They're going to be like, oh, that guy from that podcast where there's where uh, they meta egged all over his face. <laughs> I need to, I'm going to look up his band's name. Uh, Oscar please, Isaac band. Please don't be inside Oscar Isaac. That would be <laughs> uh, but he actually had to quit music too, because he started uh, his career as an actor at Juilliard. He was, I think he got, uh, uh, um, accepted to Juilliard and then, but that led to him being in this movie, this Cohen movie that we're watching right now, which is uh, inside Lewin Davis that you were talking about earlier, just to give people a little bit of uh, direction on what this movie is. This is written and directed and produced and edited by Joel and Ethan Cohen, the Cohen brothers. The setting is 1961. In fact, this whole movie to me, I don't know if you agree, but it looks like a Bob Dylan cover. Oh, well, that's what it is. It is. That's exactly. Well, it's, it's like the whole film happens on the periphery of Bob Dylan. It's like if you made a movie about Bob Dylan's early days in which Bob Dylan is never there, but everyone else who is on the scene is there. That's what this is. That's what this. Yeah. That's is. the final scene. I think is Dylan. He leaves, he leaves the. Okay. Gig where Spoiler up. Can you give us. Give people oh, a chance you're right. to know you're about to spoil them. Man, if you're yeah. if you're in Meta Egg, it's all spoilers. <laughs> okay. But man, oh God. The, the the list of individuals who are in this movie, uh, including Adam Driver. Uh let's see. Gene is by Carly Mulligan. Jim 
uh, is played by Justin Timberlake. That Carrie is, Mulligan, by the way, not Carly. Carrie, what'd you say? Carrie Mulligan. Carrie Mug- Mulligan. That's I yeah. thought. That's what I said. Um, the the driver, the scene with Adam Driver, Justin Timberlake, and Oscar Isaac singing that song. Though, do you remember that scene? Oh yeah, about the spaceman. Man, that's phenomenal scene. It's so uncomfortable in, in a Coen Brothers way, but there's also like magic there. Oh yeah. The use of music throughout the entirety of the, in, in the way that, like we were talking earlier today about, oh brother, out where out thou. This, mo- this movie reminds me a lot of that. Um, but there was some things also like they, uh, uh, well, first off, what what would you like to talk about as far as this movie is concerned? Because this seems to be a big a big movie for you. Uh, well, you know, it's uh, I know you you let me in on the one of the things that you really want to focus on with Oscar Isaac is about doubles, and uh, when you're when I started thinking about that and I was thinking about this movie, it put me in mind of John Butler Train. You know, John Butler Train. Is that a is that a musical? Uh, no, no. Uh, so John Butler Train was the name uh, under which Phil Oakes, the singer songwriter from the '60s, used to play. That was his alter ego. Uh, I actually don't like the term alter ego. It's easy to use, but as someone who's used them in the past, they're more like I don't know shamanic devices. Uh, Alter ego makes it sound like it's a psychological phenomenon rather than an artistic one. But anyway, John Butler Train was the shamanic device slash alter ego of this political folk singer, Phil Oakes, in the years before he committed suicide. And he would go on stages like around 1975. So this is pre-punk, pre-Andy Kaufman. Uh, what's Sorry. going on? Uh, I was bringing up a Phil Oaks video while you talk, so just give me cool. a second that's, while you. That's cool. um, so uh, and he would, and this is after he had been pretty much like neck and neck as far as cultural relevance with Bob Dylan in the early years, coming out of that scene that's doc- that that musical scene that's documented in Inside Lewin Davis, and. Phil Oaks was the political one, and Bob Dylan was the guy who was political for a little while and then went pop. And that was what a lot of that uh, booing at the Bob Dylan concerts was was about. Not particularly about a setup between Phil Oaks and Bob Dylan, but in a way between the, the aesthetic that Phil Oaks and Pete Seeger represented, which was more of a, you know, a solitary, the Woody Guthrie style of a solitary singer speaking truth you know, at a ra- at rallies and marches and gathering people. And Bob Dylan, you know, going electric was, you know, going more into the pop realm and that offended a lot of people. And I, I don't believe in booing musicians, but I also get how that was, a you know, in that a lot of the the scene that's documented in, inside Lewin Davis got left behind. And Phil Oaks was kind of one of those people, although not entirely. He was really important politically. He performed at the Chicago convention in 1968. He's one of the people who was cut out of that terrible Chicago seven movie that Aaron Sorkin made. If you want to hear us talk about that on the podcast, you could listen to our episode about uh, the film, the November men, which is a really great political film. And uh, we only discussed a uh, trial of the Chicago seven as sort of to contrast with uh, what revi- what ugly revisionist history it looks like. Anyway, uh, Phil Oaks was part of that whole movement, and uh, he was just sort of on the cultural edge of things, but he was also on the edge of things psychologically. And he, I guess towards the end, he was losing his uh, touch with reality. And so he would perform under this name, John Butler Train, and he'd come out on stage and sing songs and talk about how he was the guy who killed Phil Oaks. And he had like, he would have a hammer in his belt and he'd, in between songs, he brandished the, the hammer at the audience and it, get, it would get really intense and scary. Um, and then, so I was thinking about that and then thinking about how that was a powerful shamanic device that I guess helped him, even though suicide isn't a positive thing in any way, was part of his suicide process. Uh, you could wow. almost look at it as a living suicide note. Uh, That's that, and, and you shared a video with me that uh, a 
that uh, like a, an animated video about Phil Oaks, and it starts with him talking as John Butler Train, although he says Luke Train in the video you sent, so maybe he was evolving that character. Ah. But uh, as someone myself who has worked with a musical shamanic device named uh, Andy Schmushkin, who uh, is was kind of crafted, not entirely in the Phil Oaks mode, but the idea was that he was a cross between James Taylor and Lenny Bruce, which is pretty much a weird, like a backhand description of a Phil Oaks type guy. And uh, maybe you'll, you'll play a video. People can find the music of Andy Schmushkin. That's Schmushkin, S-H-M-U-S-H-K-I-N. By the way, uh, Will, this video, you notice that David Urie's in there? Yeah, I love yeah. David Urie. David <laughs> yeah. Urie is an actor. We'll see him right there, I believe that was yeah. him. He's a yeah. lot younger there, but uh, David Urie, yeah. you might Robin know Ed. from Birds of Prey. He was on Breaking Bad. He's about to be on uh, Call Saul, I think. They're yeah. bringing back his character from Breaking Bad to Call Saul. <laughs> um, but what else? Oh, man, he's all over Disney. The guy's literally in everything. He was in the series Heroes. Uh, he's just a... This 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 song is called there he is. This song mm -hmm. is called uh, Christmas Cunnilingus. If I remember correctly, this yeah, was Christmas on Christmas Cunnilingus. I don't know if it's Cunnilingus, just Cunnilingus. You know, it's be light with your tongue, my friend. Be, be light with your tongue, my friend. So yes, it's Christmas Cunnilingus by Andy Schmushkin. Was put out. That's actually filmed in the National Lampoon offices for a brief moment. Schmushkin was signed to National Lampoon Records, and uh, but. I wouldn't just try and shoehorn Schmushkin into this just because he's a singer and because Lewin Davis is the thing that's interesting, because I know you explore synchronicity here, right. is that this uh, Schmushkin is really my family name on my mom's yeah. side. My great, this is true, my great grandfather, Isaac sure Schmushkin. Not, you, you guys aren't related? Uh, uh, well, we are, yeah, we are, we're shamanically related. So <laughs> my. Great grandfather Isaac Schmushkin uh, was one of the original like Trotskyite communist revolutionaries in the early part of the 20th century, and then in the in around the 20s he left because things were getting hairy for the original revolutionaries, and or like mid 20s I guess, and he came to America and he was a he became a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer in the United States, and he. He worked as like uh, on the trial of the Scottsboro Boys, which was a very a landmark anti-lynching trial that uh, that took place in 1931 when a bunch of black kids, teenagers, were accused of raping a white woman and convicted to like all convicted to to death or sentenced to death by an all-white jury. And then the NAACP and the American Communist Party sent a bunch of lawyers down there, and that and that was, in a lot of people think, was one of the important steps in beginning the civil rights movement. And Isaac, and so for me, Isaac Schmushkin and Oscar Isaac and the songwriter that he... Uh-oh. Oh, fuck. It looks like, it looks like Andros froze on us. Go down one. He's... Show that He's back again. Okay, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, we just lost your audio. Oh, uh, you know, yeah, of course. As soon as I started talking about how the American Communist Party was responsible for fighting against against lynching in the United States, in fact, the only political party in the 1930s in the United States that was actively opposing lynching, of course, that's when the stream booted me. <laughs> it dragged you down. Well, you know, so, think about it. Do you, do you know? You didn't know who Phil Oaks was before before this call. I'm not outing you. No, I knew who Andy Schmushkin was. And it's yes. weird because we were talking about David Yuri. There's another double for David Yuri called Kim Tanaka. Yes. There's there's like this doubling thing going on, which of course, I mean, because we're kind of talking about Oscar Isaac and 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 Moon Moon Knight. I mean. That's the whole theme of Moon Knight, right? He's he he's he's got a split personality plus an Egyptian like archetype in his head. 
So is the so, idea that Adam created Stephen, or are they separate yeah, people? Wait, is it, no Mark? Mark, Mark, and Sorry. Stephen. Mark so, created Stephen. Mark created Stephen as kind of like an escape, so he didn't have to deal with the the same shit that Stephen had to deal with. Right, and then so exactly that's exactly what I'm talking about about a shamanic device. That's exactly the same function that Shmushkin fulfills for me, and I'm sure. And I well, I don't know, but I would, I have a sense that that's the function that John Butler Train functioned as for. Uh, for Phil Oaks. And I think okay. anyone who's been an actor probably understands this, is that you can use a character you're playing to stand just to the side of you, and there are things that you have, there's ways that you have access to ways of being that you wouldn't have when you're hamstrung by, you know, your own being. Right. And, you know, whether you. it's, you know, whatever, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a performing artist to have a shamanic device that's a different version of you. Uh, but uh, for some of us, it helps. It's interesting. I mean, other people uh, have done this before, like David Bowie. Um, yeah. But of course, that's the, the well, it's OK. So what, to, to keep writers in the, moving. Writers in the 18th century did it all the time. I like this is, I mean, as from a writer's standpoint, just a nom de plume is that, you know, it allows you to, to go about your normal life and then to step into this other being. And, and I guess that's where we are with our avatars and social media, although it, I think it's different. Okay, Sorry. so we're going to move on just for the sake. I know that there's 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 more there. No, no, no. That's, just... that, that's a good, that's a good, you, you, now you have a, a picture of my crazy brain now let's talk about these films. Let's go. The world no, okay. is wrong. So we'll just we'll just go right to another uh, double movie. Uh, this is Annihilation, two thousand and eighteen, written and directed. This seems to be a theme, in my opinion, for Oscar Isaac. A lot of his main films are like the writer is the director. These are like these are passion projects. It feels like. But this movie is yeah. written and directed by Alex Garland, star starring Natalie Portman as Lena, Oscar Isaac as Kane, his, uh, his, uh, or, or, or rather Portman's uh, husband, and, and another person of interest as far as concerning you, this is another person that could, touches you, is Jennifer Jason Lee as Dr. Ventress. Before, before Jennifer Jason Lee has touched me, you're right. <laughs> Jennifer Jason Lee was in a movie with you called The Prom. That um, who was the original director about that? I can't remember. Well, he's the, he's the director. He's not the original. He's the only director. Uh, Steve Shaneberg. And what's particularly interesting about that is that the screenplay was written by Dennis Johnson, the novelist, and ah. uh, the one, who, the guy who wrote Jesus's Son, and uh, a, his book Darkness at Noon is being made into a film by Claire Denis. That's going to be coming out, I think, next year. I think it might already be done. But yeah, uh, Dennis Johnson's an amazing writer, and it was uh, very cool well, to it, be in one of his rare screenplays. That was like one of uh, Soderbergh's first films, though, wasn't Sh it? No, not Steven Soderbergh. Steve Shaneberg. Oh. Shaneberg is the director of Secretary. The Secretary. Her, an imaginary. The Secretary had John Hall's sister, Maggie. Maggie was in Mag that. Yeah. Yeah. Very sexualized, very like uh, coming of age. The, the the prom basically deals with an individual you uh, who has birth uh, the birthmarks all over his body, so it's kind of made him shy. Like I don't think any girls ever seen him naked. Prom's coming up; it's the end of high school, and he starts going to a. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. He starts going to basically a strip club or like a, a strip Stripper arcade. Boots. Yeah, stripper um, boots. Yeah. Where it was called the Dunes, if I remember correctly. That's right. What, um, also in this movie, Annihilation, is uh, Tessa Thompson, who played the Valkyrie in the MCU, and Gina Rodriguez, who played Jane the Virgin. Uh, of course, the doubling up of the personalities. 
It's weird. This movie has Natalie Portman, who plays Padme, Oscar Isaac, who plays Poe Dameron, and the new sequels. Um, and even Jason, Jennifer Jason's Lee is Ventress, who is the main adversary during the Clone Wars to Anakin Skywalker. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> but Wait, of course, Jennifer Jason Lee is in right? Clone Wars? The meteorite comes down to the planet. It takes over Natalie Portman's husband. And then they creates like a double of him, right? That's like the ending scene is almost reminiscent of Black Swan with Natalie Portman and uh, Mia Kunitz, where there's like a, a split personality, so to speak. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So again, we have this mirroring of individuals. Is there anything else that you would like to mention about this movie? Uh, oh, just that I love it. I love the the weird dance scene at the end, how the, the sort of big yeah, horror right. moment is a dance scene. This is just, I think is one of the most original uh, sci-fi films I've seen, just completely coming from a different place than, uh, than most films like it. And, you know, you want... You want strong women, like strong, complex female protagonists. This you got it here. This is that's why I mentioned great. the actresses that were in the movie. Uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, of course, plays the doctor she's who so takes them in into this. the shimmer. Yeah, she's great. She's just so but, tough in this movie. But everybody Jennifer. who goes into the missing men are females. Mm -hmm. Every the the crew that goes in to to figure out what happened to her husband. The the crew, like everybody that survives, uh, Tessa Thompson, uh, Gina Rodriguez, Jennifer Jason Lee, Natalie Portman are like a tactical unit that go in together. There's weird things, too, about this movie, because if you remember, it has to do with reflected light. For some reason, Natalie Portman all has to do with like this rainbow uh, idea. Like you can see that in um, in uh, Thor, how the rainbow bridge and that that's. The, the shimmer is basically like a rainbow seal over this area that is mixing the spectrum of different species together. And in one scene, you see like uh, tree people, so to speak. And Natalie yeah. Portman has this weird, weird sync, weird synchronicity where she's, she's like taking care of these plants and where the heart is. And in her first movie, The Professional, Leon the Professional, she carries around that little plant. So there's this whole like rainbow plant thing that's going on. I'm just saying that as an aside because I'm a big Portman fan. But this- Well, you know, if you're going to build a port of man, you're going <laughs> to need an earth, earthen things. So she's oh. gathering and creating the man port. Oh, with all of these flowers and just yeah. trees everywhere. It's like lush, very lush. We're going to go, we're going to move along because I don't know how much time you have, but we're going to go to another movie right now, which is Dune from 2021. Um, we, we already talked about Dune a little bit, but of course. Now, you, 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 were, you were clear on I, Annihilation that the whole thing is that Oscar Isaacs is a double of himself. Yeah. And they, I mean, they all become doubles of themselves when they go in there. Okay. Right. So the in dance that you were talking about, like I said, it was reminiscent of like Black Swan. Because although I haven't paid too much attention to Black Swan, that's how I understand she's performing. A, she kind of creates a bad version of herself, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then the last da dance sequence that's in Annihilation is uh, Natalie Portman faced for the fact that whatever this meteor brought to Earth that's laying in the bottom of this lighthouse comes out as like a mirror image of herself. And like you, there's this ballet where one person mirrors the image she can't leave because it matches her movements and then mm -hmm. when she leaves if i remember correctly she goes back to oscar isaac and ask him like which one are you and he's like i i don't i don't know if he doesn't know or yeah. he's like I, i'm the copy we're both the copy and it's very it's it, it to me i think that movie is a lot related to d or x machina um yeah because, which Oscar Isaac is also in. We're not going to talk about that one too much today. But there's a big relationship in what, what, what's real. What, how can you be convinced by the unreality double, so to speak? 
uh, ex machina, they have to prove that it's a computer. He brings somebody in there. And I, I feel like that, that theme kind of encapsulates the whole mirror image that we're dealing with with Oscar Isaac through Moon Knight. It's there in Annihilation. Like you pointed out that it's there in Lewin Davis. So, I mean... Well, and in, and in Lewin Davis, it's also that... I mean, there's the connection with John Butler Train. That's, a, that's more tenuous. But in that film, one of the main hooks for me, because I've lived it, is that he was partners with, he was part of a song, a singer song, uh, sorry, he's a part of a singing duo, like a Simon and Garfunkel type thing. And George. his partner killed himself. Um, Off the George Washington Bridge. Right. And so he is walking around as half of something. Mm. He lost his double. Basically. His brother was his other in mirror image, so to speak. Like he, right. he, he's unsuccessful without his brother. And even when he goes to go do a job, ah, well, that's that's fucking interesting. Because even when he goes to do the to do the the, the audition, audition or whatever, they're like, get back yeah. together. And he's like, well, that's not going to happen because he's dead. That's fascinating. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So, 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 just to keep up with time, we're going to move to the 1965 novel Dune that was remade into a movie in 2021. You're so good about pronunciations, my friend. So please tell us who this is written and directed by, because I know that there was an issue about all of this on your own podcast. Oh yes. Uh, sorry. It's uh, Dennis Villeneuve. Denis Villeneuve. 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 It was written and directed. E. Villeneuve. I, I hope that Star Wars fans were out there. We were talking about Star Wars and Annihilation, but there's there's a clear and present correlation to Dune and Star Wars, seeing that they both take place on desert isle or desert uh, desert planets that in in the center storyline revolves around the prophecies of a chosen one. Um, there's actually uh, news articles and that I've trading read. Trading of spice, there's the whole spice trading thing. Spice trading is exact amundo. And the emperor, the base, the emperor plays both sides. Both he he the the entire war is controlled by the emperor basically to get rid of his competition. Uh, Frank, there's Frank Herbert had a he he was like I don't think that he sued. Java Hunt's a big worm. Sorry, sorry. Y yeah. The, the the there's even the the what are they called uh, crates like the the snake thingies mm -hmm. the, the spice worms basically are shown in uh, Mandalorian because of the the crate dragons come out that's what they are that's where they came from that's where the idea like uh, Lucas was borrowing everything including the idea of these um, prophetic. Yeah like the, the lifting things from ancient mythology to create pop culture, so to speak. So is Oscar doubled in this? No, Oscar plays Leto Atreides, father of Paul Atreides. I don't think there is a double to this movie. However, uh, one of Oscar Isaac's first movies was uh, something called the nativity scene where Oscar plays Joseph, the father of Jesus. So, yeah, that was him. Oh. I yeah, that was I, yeah. The, so 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 no, there's no technical double. However, what's although Dune is a double. Movie, so, what's that? Well, Dune is a double because you've got two Dunes. You do. You have two Dunes plus your Dune with Jennifer Jason Lee. Um, oh yeah, that's yeah. That's not yeah. That's all of it. That's a whole it's other related. kind of dunes, my friend. It's a whole other kind of dunes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Those dunes were a little bit sticky, I think. The vinyl chairs were for sure. Um, <laughs> gross, man. Get, get back to the Christmas kind of lingus. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like what's important to understand about dune as far as its relationship to moon Knight is the desert planet and the the archetypes like moon Knight definitely the uh, i'll show it here soon or probably closer to the end of this podcast but there's there is an easter egg for carl Jung 
and Moon Knight. And they, the whole idea of being an avatar for an Egyptian god plays on the idea of archetypes. And I think that's why they put Carl Jung in there. But I, the, the correlation to Dune being the same thing, this practice of a storytelling or storyteller taking ancient mythology is almost like a paint by numbers, I, I think is as, as an important because it plays out, like I said, in the nativity story. Uh, per, per, perhaps you could see it in Annihilation too, and and we were talking about inside Lou and Davis how I feel like there might be some correlation to the Odyssey in that as well. What's going on? Should we see Myrtle is the chosen one? We back on, so we have our friends in the Obi Wan to homie says Myrtle is the chosen one. He's talking about Myrtle from Second Street Marvel. This is interesting. Because if you go up to Second Street Marvel here, it says we are back. Second Street Marvel is a comic uh, enthusiast on YouTube who has, I mean, there's, a, there's another personality. There's two different personalities. There's Trinity, and then there's Myrtle. And that's why I said Myrtle is the chosen one, because Myrtle is the double. I played a virgin once, says... Okay, so we, we've gone through Dune. Let's see what next is. The two faces of January. Hey, we're gonna talk did you, about the did you two notice? Of January. It's a little bit complicated because our friend is not in this one. Oscar Isaac, isn't it? Oscar Isaac. Oh, wait. Oscar Isaac is in it. That is correct. Yeah, Oscar sorry. Isaac, but we have I a, a we have friend a you're talking off. about. We, we, okay, so... So, I'm so I messed up there. Okay, friend. our friend is in it. He's not in the next movie. He's in Two Faces of January, but we're going to go to the next movie because of another actor who's in this movie named Vigo Mortensen. Oh, wow. And again, Vigo touches on Andros. Andros was in a movie with Vigo. But before we get to that, we're going to give you a little bit of information on the Two Faces of January, which came out in 2014. It was written and directed. By Hussein Amini, Amini, uh, Hussein Amini, uh, and his directorial directorial debut. I think that he wrote some other things, but this is the first movie that he directed, and it is based on the Patricia Highsmith's novel from 1964 of the same name. The title alludes to the two faces of the Roman god Janus, January Janus, which is where the word Janus. January comes from, and it cor corresponds to the two faced nature of all the main characters in fact in this in the marketing leading up to this movie they had two posters with different emotes for each actor so there was two posters for kirsten dunce there was two posters for oliver isaac or oscar isaac and there was two posters for vigo mortensen to highlight how their personalities changed um so there's doubles we have the doubles again we are direct confirmation of the doubles this is a great movie because of the actor quality in it i don't know if have you seen this yet andros uh i got about halfway through before we had to go on i i actually uh i tried to dress i tried to dress like oscar isaacs in it at the beginning he's oh. wearing a hat like this and a shirt like this absolutely so, yeah he's a lot younger and better looking than me but you know <laughs> He's, he's almost exactly 10 years younger than you, and I think that you guys could be brothers. Well, in another life, perhaps, or maybe in another movie. So there's another... Uh, okay, so are you familiar... This is a stupid question. I'm just I'm basically doing this just for setup. Yeah. Could you give me another one of these? If you don't mind, I don't mean to be... Are you, you're going to ask me... Are you familiar with Viggo Mortensen? Is that what you're going to ask me? <laughs> Okay, so we'll talk about the movie that you were in with Vigo earlier, but I was going to ask you if you're familiar with the Oedipal Complex. Uh, yes, I am familiar. I think I think we are. We're all familiar with the Oedipal Complex, whether or not we know it. If you believe uh, Sigmund Freud, yes. <laughs> Do you like uh, to explain it? Would you like to try your try? Okay, your you want? To... Yeah. Okay, sure. You want to get? Well, basically, I mean, basically, it's just it's based upon the Oedipus story, and in the story of Oedipus. Uh, the kid gets a prophecy that he's going to 
uh, kill his father and fuck his mother. And he says, no, this will never happen. And then somewhere along the way, he loses his way. And through a, a series of accidents, he ends up killing his father and end up ends up marrying his mother without knowing either is who they are until it's revealed. And then he is so ashamed that he, you know, dashes that he uh, poke, poke, basically tears out his own eyes. It's a happy little tale. Uh, but uh, basically this, why am I describing it? Everyone knows what the Oedipus story is, but basically oh, the cool. idea is that this archetypal story plays out on the subconscious level in everyone. And that's why it's such a powerful myth because I mean, we don't actually kill our fathers or have sex with our mothers, but that there is this power push-pull thing that it happens in a child's development when it goes from, you know, when it realizes that it's separate from the mother, because when it, it, it is birth, it's raised inside the mother, and then afterwards it's being, you know, suckled by the mother and it's all wrapped up in the mother, and then at some point it differentiates and realizes that there are other people there, and it, this most of the edible trauma, I think they say they say happens before we're even aware, before we have language. It's all you know. If for those who think that it's some sort of, um, I don't know, psychological milf porn, it's a it's a much more uh, it's a much earlier process than that. Although its vestiges do live in our uh, in the shadow area of our media diets, I think. And in, in film, whether it's in porn or just in normal films, um, that we, that these, I don't know, ancient tragedies play out so that we can uh, have some sort of catharsis. And I think that's what you're getting at in the uh, two faces of January, that there is definitely the, the, the Kirsten Dunst and the Viggo Mortensen are sort of like, well, at the very beginning, Oscar Isaacs thinks that Viggo Mortensen looks like his father, and there's it's very much set up that there is a kind of an Oedipal push-pull energy to that film. There's a sexual tension between Oscar and Viggo's wife, played by Kirsten Dunst, because she's way younger than her husband is. Viggo is about 10 years older than her. See, that's what I don't. That's why I don't feel like it is really so much of an edible thing, personally. That's more just like an, like Kirsten Dunst and Oscar Isaacs are sort of the same age, and he's this older, rich guy, which is not quite the same as if it's like. I think the implication is there. I think I. I mean, with with it being in Greece, with them talking so much about, like he's a tour guide, so immediately he's talking about Theseus. There's comments about the Minotaur. I mean, they're 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 hinting at the edible connection, not to say that it's a direct correlation. I mean, can yeah. you agree on that? Oh yeah. You'd have to so, be a dunce to not to notice that. Yeah. So I mean, okay, so let's go on to the new movie. This one, like I said before, does not have Oscar in it, but it does have Vigo, and it's pertinent because uh the it's it's a it's a dangerous method which is a movie about a russian and a 19 and it takes place in 1904 and a russian woman named sabina uh sabe is that how you pronounce that i think um, so wait, no who, uh sabina sabina splelarian Sp 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 Spielrain right. or Spielrain, probably. Yeah. Yeah, Spielrain. that's right. She plays Sabe from Star Wars. So the actress is Kara Knightley, who this is a trivia question. Most people don't know. But in the original Star Wars from Phantom Menace, not the original, but episode one, uh, Padme, played by Natalie Portman, has a double. Um, She has like decoys that she uses that takes on her role as queen in case there's ever any uh hostility towards the queen they kind of like take the danger or the the stress from her uh or the, shot or the bullet or the bomb right in fact she dies the actress who plays that and is not credited this is trivia oh. is kira knightley who plays the russian woman in dangerous method 
Of course. Well, there you go. Yeah, Although, of course, of course. it's funny that you focus on that because I feel like the da Dangerous Method is a film about uh, Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud in which part of the, like one of the main stories focuses on this character, Sabina Spielrein, who is a patient of Carl Jung played by Michael Fassbender, who he argues about with Viggo Mortensen playing Sigmund Freud. But it's funny that, you, I mean, I think you're probably right that it is, I guess, a story about the character of Sabina Spielbrand, but uh, but I, I always think of it as it's the movie about Freud and Jung, or Jung and Freud. Right. It's, 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 the, it's the movie about the, 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 the separate, the, what is it? The, the debate. Well, well, the, 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 the debate between Freud and Jung about the evolution of psychology, whether Freud's theories would, yeah, psych psychoanalysis, whether Freud's theories would be taken on totally without any uh, deviation, and or whether Jung's theories would inform or even supplant them. And I think the most exciting part of the movie is when those two are debating uh, these theories and watching that play out. Although, uh, yeah, the relationship between Michael Fassbender and Kira Knightley is probably what puts butts in seats. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a inside joke if you've seen the movie. Um, so, okay. I'd like to take a minute to con converse with you. I sent an email to the Meta Egg email that has two clips from Moon Knight that involve Ethan Hawke as uh, Oscar Isaacs. Oh, by the way, whoever's in your this guy, Beskar Batman, Batman, yeah. who's in there, his uh, he just said that uh, that he thinks that the three personalities of Moon Knight represent the ego, the id, and the superego. Yes, we showed pretty it online. good. I think that's on point. Don't you think that's pretty pretty good? I'm more into the Vigo, the id, and the super Vigo, but yeah, it's the same thing. <laughs> I guess maybe that's the road, if it is Vigo, the kid, and the super Vigo. <laughs> you know, I have to thank you for most of the Freud and Young that I, I, uh, I have investigated and that I've read. Um, I mean, everybody kind of. Oh, are you gonna out, are you gonna out me as your psycho and psychoanalyst? Uh, well, I'm. That's supposed to be confidential. <laughs> We're gonna have to go over that in our next session. Okay, go on. Oh, okay, go no, do this. Uh, Will Morgan sent from YouTube or Android that one right there. The, hit that guy, and then those should be two videos that are each ten second long. There's Carl Jung one and Carl Jung two. Just download them straight to your computer, and we'll use them that way. Um. Dude, I'll be honest with you. You look, man. You have you. You are sort of a mentor towards me. Uh, you're one of the individuals who I trust talking with about movies because you're so well versed. But you also have a, a really clear way of, uh, like I said, like uh, you're extremely positive as far as, as seeing through, sh like uh, the 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the failures of a movie. To see what its actual value and actual worth, or uh, the, what the creator actually intended, uh, like w whether it be music or not. See, sometimes if you try to talk about, like, "Hey, man, I heard this country song the other day," and some individual you're talking to would be like, "Ugh, I don't like country." You're, no. you're the type of individual would be like, "Well, how did it stack up to Towns Van Zant or something like that?" Like, you're a much more deep cut individual that I have respect for as far as not being able to have to explain too many things. Um, and I learned a lot from you too. So, so yeah, yeah. Um, you've put me on the couch before friend. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, um, uh, no, you, had, you're an intellectual. Well. You, you, you need to take that in stride. You were a, you're a good man. You're a good man. A, on Jones. Well, so thank let's see you. It, always, it always depresses me. I always feel like I like, Whenever people think of me as an intellectual, I'm like, oh boy, that's a sad state on intellect intellectualism in this country. But we, we do we do the best with what we can. Um, you know, back in back at you know back in my parents' generation, they actually read Freud and Jung and then talked about. It. 
we watched. I had to learn a lot. I mean, let's talk about your dad for a second before we continue on. Like, uh, your dad was a dream psychologist, one of the founding members of Evergreen College in Washington State. Yes, um, he was. Yeah. Uh, R Richard Jones was his name, and he was the author of many books about dream analysis. Uh, one of the books that I read ab about him, he would state uh, uh, case studies or a patient's dream, and then he would he would interpret it under Freudian psychology. Then he would do uh, Jungian psychology, and then he would do Erickson uh, psychology. And I found that fascinating because it gave uh, it, it was it, a lot of people describe it as rich, like it was really rich. I mean, and and a lot of what we what uh, in my opinion, what you do now with uh, the video to me, movies are dreams. So you analyzing and your podcast, what, what the world, what the world is wrong is almost an homage to your dad in my opinion opinion i don't know if you see it the same way oh yeah that and i mean when we've we didn't talk about it with my other podcast radio eight ball which uh we you and i have talked about on lots of other podcasts both come from this place of exactly that about my, my well my dad's theory about dreams was yes they can be used to analyze and uh diagnose neuroses for people who have very who have real problems in the sense of that they're having problems navigating reality and they're useful in that sense but they're not only useful in that sense everybody dreams and for the most part just like i was saying about movies the more pleasure we can derive from our dreams the better and whatever point of view allows you a new access in fact you could have multiple different conflicting points of view that all it like it's still your dream and this was my my dad's dream seminars people would he would read a person's dream and then everyone in the class would interpret the dream as if it was their dream without knowing who the actual dreamer was like the people the people in the class would write down the dreams my dad would read them without saying their names and by, at the end the dreamer would be able to talk about what it meant for them, but having seen it through all of these other prisms. And that's exactly, I mean, I think that's what the work that you do with Meta Egg is, you know, you just, you can watch a movie or a TV show or whatever, just from the standpoint of, this is the story of Moon Knight as written in the comic book and delivered on the film. But then when you start to look at it in the context of what does this mean in the scope of this actor, uh, Oscar Isaacs, and then I'm watching it and I'm thinking, because we're gonna be talking about synchronicity, well, we're seeing, watching this in the term, in terms of Oscar Isaacs, now I'm thinking about Isaac and I'm thinking about my grandfather, Isaac Smushkin, which makes me think of my shamanic device, Andy Smushkin, which makes me think of Inside Lewin Davis, which makes me think of Phil Oaks, which makes me think of John Butler Train, and all of that, we're all bringing all of that context to everything we do. And the more you have access to it, if you can enjoy it, the more pleasure it allows you to derive from, you know, and from media that might not even have that necessarily encoded into it. Certainly the makers of Moon Knight weren't thinking about any of this, and yet we are able to get that out of it. So, Well, I yeah. don't know. I think that maybe it, someone once told me the good ones do think about it. But of course, like in your history, not all filmmakers are good, so forth and so on. But if we look at the evidence that I have right here, they're okay. So the history of Moon Knight goes as is. In the night, in like 1954, there was a book written called Seduction of the Innocent. Um, I can bring up more information on this so I can read it right off of Wikipedia so you trust me. But Seduction of the Innocence was part of the McCarthyism of the 1950s that tried to cap what comic books could talk about because they felt that they were contributing to the delinquency of the youth. The youth were reading more comic books and not as many books. And so there was a sort of um, censorship done on what comic books could talk about, including sexual activity, homosexuality, because homosexuality was considered to be a mental illness at the time. Uh, uh, anything supernatural, you couldn't talk about vampires, you couldn't talk about werewolves, you couldn't talk about any uh, any 
sympathetic point of view for a criminal to say such as like a criminal had mental issues, therefore he committed the crime and can't be held accountable for the crime. So when that was I'm lifted, curious, were, were they were they allowed to talk about ivermectin back then? Is that <laughs> But that's a great point. I mean, we're faced with this. We're almost faced with reversed McCarthyism because it's coming from the liberal side this time. But it's almost the same idea is there's certain things you can't talk about. Because you might influence things. other people, even if they're true. You know, are you familiar with this? There's there's so we our our country now has a ministry of truth uh, that is, yes, you know, sort that of. is tasked with. Uh, and they and they've made it. They've categorized misinformation as a form of terrorism, so it now gets to be dealt with as terrorism. But there's not just misinformation. There's misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Are you familiar with this? No. I, so, I, so I, misinformation I, is when you are spreading. So you hear something that's untrue, and you spread it, but you think it's true. Disinformation is when there's something that you know isn't true and you spread it anyway. Malinformation would be knowing it's false and spreading it no, anyway. No, no. Malinformation is even if it's true, if it's, and that's what this is about. Even if it's true, if it might influence someone to be misinformed about something that is the official truth then that's malinformation. So like an example would be, okay, so if the, if the official truth is that marijuana is addictive and that's why it needs to be illegal, and you say, well, that's not, well, I, my doctor and the scientists that I spoke to tell me that it is not true that marijuana is addictive. It, you're telling something that's true, but it will, if it is, uh, if it contradicts the legal truth that it is, and might inspire people to smoke this thing. Anything can be under that under that judgment. Anything could be mal. Anything yes. could be mal. As I long mean, as the government determines, as long as the Ministry of Truth determines that it is not in accordance with the official truth, then it can be mal information. That's like if I give you my number and it encourages you to call me, and and you're not supposed to call me, then that was mal information. That's pop. I'm laughing. Because it's terrifying. Yes, because that depends on that's the that's the exact same thing that the Roman Catholic Church did to all patrons. Like only the priest can tell you what God is saying because you're not ready for it yet. But that's what everybody has fought against from the that's, beginning of censorship. Yeah. That's insane. That means anybody can tell you you're not ready for this information because you might you might take it wrong. You're too dumb for this information, is basically yes. what that says. Yes, yes. There actually were WMDs in Iraq, and you know, like if that was the official story. If it's written in the New York Times, even if it's not true, you can't say like this could get us all. You know, we're. Ter I guess by the new definition, although it is not being enforced, what we're doing now could be defined as a form of terrorism. Yeah, anything can be labeled. We're talking, just by talking about the fact, by talking about what malinformation is, truthfully, we are, in a sense, engaging in malinformation. Because we're telling something that's true, but it might lead people to not trust the definition of malinformation. I mean, it sounds this, like it sounds like it's okay. like it's out of Brazil, right? This is right out. This is. There's yeah. three, just like the ego, the id, and the super ego. It's like yeah. what it's basically how you can hide information. You can compart. That's what people do, right? They compartmentalize information that they can't handle in their head. That's what we've been talking about the whole time, right? With this like imaginary friend idea that this this personality of mine can handle this information, but this one can't, and this one can't. So the other two have to hide it from this guy. Is that does that make sense? Like, yeah, that means only an authority can handle the information, which means that you can cap who's an authority. Like you, if you, if you hide the information from someone, then they can't become 
knowledgeable enough to to even comprehend the information. That's so fucking twisted, man. Well, it's not even just that you when you hide the information, when you make it so that the person who has the information can't share it unless they have the authority. And in order to be an authority, you have to accept the official definition of things. I see some people using the term conspiracy theory in the in the comments. I, I find that, that to be a it's an it's an unhelpful term because uh, every you know pretty much everything that we don't know that we're trying to figure out if it involves somebody's intent is a conspiracy theory, and people spin them all the time. You know. Well, I mean, uh, to, but to, to, uh, to, to, it's to usually. To hold, really, it, oh, go on. That's what he's saying. Sounds like conspiracy theory, which I I think came from the CIA. The CI, the there is a conspiracy theory that the word conspiracy theory was basically. Um, uh, well, of course, it doesn't matter what it was intended. by the CIA. Yeah, to, yeah so no, I mean, of course, to, it's, it's like it's like so many things. These cognitive dissonant things that are deployed against us to keep us from thinking clearly, and we have to just keep sort of whacking our way through the thicket of them to get to some level of intelligent conversation. And, you know, I'm kind of ruining the game here by bringing all this up because the fun thing is when you're talking about movies, you can kind of get away with, like, did the director mean to put that in or am I just projecting? Like, it, it's not when you're talking about author's intent, nobody says, well, is that, it's a conspiracy theory that Orson Welles really meant to be talking about uh, William Randolph Hearst instead of Charles Foster, Charles Foster Kane in the movie Citizen Kane. I guess that's a conspiracy theory. It's been kind of well documented, but in film and in art, we kind of get away with it. When we start to get into larger issues, and, I, and I'm the one who brought up new definitions of terrorism and misinformation and malinformation and disinformation, just because that's where my mind goes, and I'm sorry that I soiled your show with it, but uh, <laughs> maybe we can get it back on track into the, to talking about the movies, because that's fun. Well, no, there's a there's a similar theme in, in, uh, in there's a similar theme in Moon Knight where Ethan Hawke plays his therapist who's basically trying to convince him that he's interpreted certain information incorrectly. Um, right. If we could play the Carl Jung number one clip, uh, that will get us back on traps, tracks, so to speak. Um, if you can figure out how to add that as a screen and then uh yeah you had it just a second ago right there right boom yeah okay all right yeah it looks like it's going full screen show it and then let's yeah i don't think that we could well, that hear that thing, but... that was the whole thing basically no no tree can ascend to heaven if it cannot to uh, ascend or no, no tree can ascend to heaven. If the roots. the roots don't go down to hell, the exact quote is a quote from Carl Jung. Um, uh, tree to heaven, we'll say to heaven, hell. And then that'll give us the exact quote. No tree. It is said can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. Reach the depths of, reach the depths of hell. And then right after or that... as did, the Ozark Mountain Daredevil said, if you want to get to heaven, you got to raise a little hell. <laughs> but I mean, I feel like because of the mental health connotations and Moon Knight, of course they were referencing Carl Jung directly. Um, and that was like a Carl Jung Easter egg. Right after that, because we have a sound difficulty, I won't play the next clip because it's blurry anyways, but he says because of the low level quality of this movie, and they're talking about how Moon, Knight, it, Moon's, Moon Knight's plot as a series is mirroring this VHS movie that Oscar Isaac had watched in his youth. The, 
therapist is trying to convince them that he's mentally divergent. I'm not mentally divergent. You're mentally divergent. Sorry. <laughs> That's a quote from 12 Monkeys, I think. Um, <laughs> huh? huh? So anyways, he says something along by judging by the low quality of the production of this movie, I feel like no one has seen it. Is that a coincidence? Is what he wow. said. I missed that. And again, that. the coincidence... The whole idea of a coincidence is the Carl Jung theory of as far as synchronicity goes. We're going to use this idea right here to jump off into one of your movies that has low production quality and no one has fucking seen. Which um, one are you talking about? Tripwire. <laughs> oh, yeah. That definitely, that definitely has low production quality and nobody has seen it. Uh, but it's an amazing cast. Yafit Kodo, David Warner. Yes. Uh, uh Yafis Koto, is that how you pronounce his name? Oh he yeah, get to work with Yafis Koto. Yeah. But I mean, he's uh he's in Alien, if I remember yeah. correctly, the original Alien, and he's also in uh Live and Let Die, the James Bond movie. Yeah. Um David Warner, of course, people will recognize from Titanic as uh the individual who was chasing Leonardo DiCaprio, the, the bodyguard, so to speak, of uh, the individual who was married to uh, with Kate Winslet. Um, but yeah, it's a strong cast. There's also Isabella Hoffman, who plays Annie. Uh, Charlotte Lewis, Charlotte Lewis, who played Trudy. From The Golden Child, yeah. Yeah, from The Golden Child, with uh, the, the Eddie Murphy's love interest from The Golden Child. Um, so yeah, it's a weird movie. How did that, how did that movie get made? No, that's just, you know, they were, they were making, oh, forget it. I think it's Cinetel. Cinetel was making lots of just low budget action features at that point. And I was working a lot and I got cast in this film. And, um, I think the reason we're talking about it is because that's the film where I met Viggo Mortensen. And uh, he played, I don't know, terrorist number five. Actually, a guy, a character named Hans. Yeah, and we Hans. had a scene together. I, my character is the son of this um, ATF officer played by Terrence Knox, who kills David Warner's son in, uh, you know, when David Warner is pulling off some heist. And so David Warner, his revenge, kidnaps Terrence Knox's son. That's me. Actually, not just the son of Terrence Knox. It, it, Meg Foster was played my mom. Pretty cool to have Meg Foster as your mom for the yeah, course of the shoot. Yeah, uh, some people might remember her from uh, They Live, if I remember oh, yeah. correctly. Yeah, she's got those those uh, amazing eyes. Anyway, um, so ha but Viggo Mortensen plays one of the many uh, terrorists, uh, badasses in uh, David Warner's gang is a German terrorist named Hans who uh, tries to, I don't know, tries to move me from one area to the other and I grab some acid and throw it in his face and escape. And that was the beginning of a wonderful friendship. Uh, some, who knew that throwing acid in someone's face, very actually edible if you want to get into this. I, so I blinded him, the, uh, I blinded Sigmund Freud with my acid jizz to, to run away. Uh, in that film, but uh, I did I did repay him. We ended up I actually ended up introducing him to my agent at that time because he was agentless, and she's still his manager. And every time I see her, she's like, "You bought me a house." I say, "You're welcome. Thanks for the tickets." And uh, and yeah, that's my Vigo Mortensen story, and I'm sticking to it. No, I mean, the Oedipal connection is definitely there. I had forgotten about the acid to the eyes, but like you said, Oedipal, like he gouges out his eyes. There's a big relationship to David Warner's connection to uh, Terrence Knox's character. So War David Warner is the individual you said they played in, in, in Titanic. He's the bad guy. He kidnaps you because- He also played dad. Jack the Ripper in uh, Time After Time, a great film from like 1979 with Malcolm McDowell and Mary Steenburgen. Nice. That's my favorite David Warner films, but go on. 
No, that's a great movie. It, it's a great, it's a, it's an important movie that Meta Egg will talk about later on also. So I'm glad you brought it up. However, for, for our purposes here, the point is, is that your dad played by Terrence Knox basically kills David Warner's kid. So David Warner kill like kidnaps you and, and drugs you and keeps you and, and uh, uh, incapacitated until your father comes back and recognizes you um or, or or rescues you excuse me uh the the edible connection is why i brought it up uh right now we're showing um uh, clips from a movie that i did about you that explored your uh cinematic connections to the edible complex as well as mirrors which is why i brought you here today because there's uh, a definite theme that travels throughout your movies where you're always seeing yourself inside of a mirror or talking to yourself in front of a mirror. One of the best examples of that is Nightmare on Elm Street 4, a dream master where you play Rick and your death scene, you wake up in the bathroom, you come out of the stall and you see your, you see a mirror in front of you with your seer, your sister and, there's this whole idea of you traveling through the mirror to go to another reality like Alice in Wonderland, but it definitely happens throughout. Um, right now, I think they're talking about uh, redheads and they're talking about some of the stuff that you've been in, including in the video Wilcox. we're watching. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the mirror part. Uh, and it's, it, it's showing how the mirror connects to this idea. Here's the scene from, from Nightmare on Elm Street 4. There's you as Rick. There's the mirror that your sister drums through, played by Lisa Wilcox, who I might add was just on your, your podcast, uh, The World is Wrong, uh, where you guys talk to a lot of directors. You guys talk to, to actors about the movies that uh, we're talking about. I think that the movie you're talking about in that particular episode is, is Nightmare on Elm Street 5. However, you yeah. died in four as her brother. Yes, indeed. So yeah, yeah, there are a lot of mirrors. You're, you're making the point here. There's a lot of mirrors in my movies. Uh, right. I think that I think that you, one of your themes has a lot to do with not necessarily. I, I feel like Oscar Isaac has to do with mental illness, and I feel like you have to do with psychoanalysis, in a way. And I think that you're joined through subject matter as far as ideas in this, in this way that has to do with like, uh, like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, sort of six degrees of Ethan Hawke, I guess six degrees of Oscar Isaac that you're really yeah. close connected. And in fact, we saw two of them tonight with, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee. And we saw again with Vigo Mortensen, how you touch them, but the subject matters continue over. Uh, so you're kind of like a clone or, or perhaps, Oscar Isaac is a clone of you or a mirror image of you, sort of like a later generation version of the same topics that you covered. Here, this is that was you and Jennifer Jason Lee. And also Night Trap. See, yeah. the interesting thing about you is you're just not mirrors. To in your specific symbol set, you have mirrors, and it shows the relationship of how a TV is also a mirror. Isaac doesn't have that. Isaac has like deserts. If you look at Apocalypse with X-Men, uh, where, where Michael Fassbender plays Magneto, and there's also a connection to Dune because there's a, the finality of a prophecy, the end of the world prophecy, Apocalypse comes, he brings four horsemen. And I'm, I'm, I'm only telling you the topic in case you're not a fan of uh, superhero movies and haven't seen Apocalypse by X-Men. It's not one of the greatest movies. Again, we're talking about the world is wrong about this movie because it relays the relationship between Egypt and Moon Knight and Oscar Isaac and these ancient the civilizations that were explored and the and the two faces of January and all of that is like uh, ar ar archetypal as far as like how his message is relayed through his movies consistently through synchronicity or whatever. You have the same thing, even though you guys are on two spectrums of who gets to pick their movies or whatnot. Uh, and I think that 
because of that, whatever it is, that force that makes you guys have that similar subject over and over, that, that synchronistic force, you are in these movies with Vigo Mortensen because of that. Like somehow whatever his energy is mixes with your energy and it, it, in, it, it moves over, so to speak. I mean, is that something we're, we're about to look at another movie you did that kind of nails the final nail into the coffin. It, it, it just finishes. Of my it. career. Thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, personally, <laughs> I would like to see you do more. Personally, I would like. I, I, I actually just acted in my first film in a long time. So, really, a small role, Tell small us more. role, but with a great, uh, a great director who's who works out of Boulder, Colorado, a guy named Skinner Myers, um, and uh, yeah, very, very, very small role. But uh, I, at this point in my life, I'd rather be doing a small role in a film with a director who I really respect. Then, you know, well, I'm, I don't really have the choices. I'm very happy to be getting a chance to work with a director I really respect, even if it's playing a small role in it. And I've played big roles in films that uh, that I don't have that same feeling about. So, yeah. Hmm. Anyway, so I'm not saying that it's all coming back, but if you're trying to put nails in the coffin, just put those nails away. <laughs> put the coffin in the garage. I'm not dead yet. Well, I mean, I, what I said, it, it will it will punctuate the point that we've tried to make on this. Better, better phrasing. Thank you. And what is that? Oh, Are, wow. to talk yeah. about? This is uh, my friend um, Tim, who <laughs> I, 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 I'm kind of hesitant to say his whole. I'm kind of hesitant to say his whole name on air. Just to Don't give, give anyone's name away. Get but Tim there. is another researcher who does great work uh, along the same things that we do. He's a guy I greatly respect, and uh, he's a big fan of movies. So I'm, 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 I'm really happy to see him joining us in the chat room right now, and and Welcome. bringing up the point that he's a big fan of the world is wrong. Also, again, oh, if you. you have not heard this podcast, it is very entertaining. It is very amusing. Andras is well prepared super duper prepared bring a pencil and some paper to take notes because he will teach you something on the world is wrong and um who is your uh, co-host name brian connelly uh, the great brian connelly the great brian connelly you guys have a chemistry that is that is unparalleled i enjoy it a great deal you guys funny you you're you're pretty humorous it makes me laugh um thanks we enjoy ourselves We're talking about that's why we do it we, we love talking to each other and we love well, movies. Talk to me about April's Arrival or the okay, arrival that's the film you want to talk April. about. Yes, uh, April's Arrival. It's a film. It is. Uh, well, it's a it's a film that could be best described by John Lennon's line from "Come Together." It's a film that's got to be good looking because it's so hard to see. Uh, it is. Uh, it's a film that I made in Vienna in 1991. 1990-91 with a director named Michel Schotenberg and I play the lead character of Avro Ortega, uh, a character who is basically a veiled example of an Oedipus. He, uh, he comes to this strange town and he meets up with this strange woman and he finds out after they have already connected uh, physically in some odd ways and sexual ways that she is his mother and uh and hilarity ensues no there is no hilarity but it is a beautiful and strange film it's there's the only version that can be found there is no english language version there's only a dubbed german version that exists it was a minor hit in austria in the early 90s i guess it played a lot on tv uh people in vienna uh, our, our, who grew up in that time period are quite familiar with this film. Like you might be of uh, like an after school special or something that played all the time. Um, yeah. And I play the character of Averill and 
yeah, what else? And it did. We shot it in Vienna, which is where Jung and Freud had the conversations that are documented in A Dangerous Method. And so, uh, so yeah, what else? What do you want to know? How was it made? Like, why was it made? Like, how did an American actor even get on Viennan soil? Okay, so it was a film. So Michel Schottenberg and his crew had been making about a film a year. Before that, they were they were a theater company. He was like this very big star of theater and uh, theater, became a theater director. And this is at a time in the 80s and 90s where theater was, you know, a bigger deal and was definitely a bigger deal in Vienna. And in Vienna, they have a fund to support the arts. And they were, this arts fund gave Michel Schottenberg and his, Berg and his crew the money to make this film. But the deal was that they needed to find a, an American actor to play the lead because on the off chance that that American actor became Johnny Depp or Brad Pitt or whatever, then they could market it in the United States and in England. And the English speaking audience is the biggest movie, uh, money making movie part, uh, money mo money making audience in the movie business. And it's even weirder than that because it was written in German uh, in an Austrian dialect and then translated to English because they were only going to shoot it in English because, again, American audiences won't watch dubbed films, but European audiences are used to it. So they figured that even though they, they were most they were most likely only going to do a German language version of it, they would do a dubbed German language version of it shot in English on the again on the off chance that we hit gold and it went to a more international market. Uh, but even weirder than that is that the way they did the uh, translation into English was this very weird way of speaking English so that it would fit with the dub. So if if the if the if the character was to say please pass me the salt. I didn't have the line, please pass me the salt, but like use that as an example. In German, it would be, the dialect would be, pass the salt, please. Pa pass, to me, pass the salt, please. So then I would say the line in English, to me, pass, pass the salt, please. So if you ever, if they ever were to do an English language version of it, it would still be very weird language for an English audience. So even mm -hmm. though it wouldn't be dubbed, that the characters would be speaking in a way that no English speaker would ever speak, yeah. which makes you really want to see that version of the movie, but I doubt that I ever will. Anyway, so that's how I came to be. They, they, these German, these Viennese producers came to America, found me, thought mm -hmm. that I was perfect Averill, said, this is a guy who will fuck his mother, and then took me to Vienna and uh, were, I, you know, like most people who have hired me, uh, some de to some degree impressed and some degrees disappointed. Uh, I was not as comfortable fucking my mother as they thought, so <laughs> I had to act. I had to just act. <laughs> uh, but my mother was played by a great actress named Maria Beale, who's a, a pretty famous singer in Vienna from mm. the eighties. Yeah. So there you go. So how do you how do you feel as as um, filmmakers? How how does how does that group of Viennans stack up to the American movies that you were involved with? Uh, well, working with a crew that's been working together, you know, they basically would, they would shoot a film in the summer, cut it through the winter while they were writing another one and then make another one. I mean, it was pretty special. It was, uh, it was very different uh, than most American productions I've been involved in. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty decadent. We ate really well. We, they drank a lot. I wonder if it's still like that there, the amount of drinking that was going on, uh, not necessarily on the set, but people, you know, afterwards enough so that people, you know, I had, I had to learn how to say no or hold my liquor pretty well to keep up with them. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, but there was just a whole craft sense of craftsmanship and continuity that is uh, rarely present unless you happen to be a part of like Woody Allen's crews and the, 
you know, 80s and 90s, you know, just churning out a film every year and working with the same departments and just getting a flow going. Mostly on films, people are just getting to know each other when the job ends. So, mm. um, so and I, I hate to do this to you, Will, but I'm going to have to cut this short in just a couple of minutes. So if there's anything else you want from me. Uh, sure. Yeah. I was about to just ask um, if there's anything else that you would like to leave us with or to express to us that's coming up on The World is Wrong uh, would be interesting to hear as well. Um, so any, anything you got, uh, is, is appreciative for, our, for, our, for our outro. Okay. Well, I'll just say definitely, please check out the world is wrong podcast. Uh, as Will said, you can find it anywhere you get your podcasts. We have a website, the world is wrong podcast.com. We're just finishing up our second season. We have 80 episodes, so that'll probably keep you, uh, keep you fed on movies until we come back in the fall with our third season. And I really encourage you to check out the music of Andy Schmushkin. There's a web, uh, a song up on, uh, you know, an album up on Bandcamp called Total Fucking Bullshit, which was the album that we were going to put out, that we were going to put out on National Lampoon Records, and now it's available there. And it's not up yet, but if you're looking at this video sometime after June 1st, 2022. You can find all of my work at the website previouslyyours.com. It also works as andrasjones.com, but it is called Previously Yours. My band was called Mr. Jones and the Previous, and then just the Previous, and uh, and so that's why the site is called Previously Yours, and it gathers all my music and all my films and all my podcasts and my book and all the different things that I do. That if I tried to talk about all of them here it would be insufferable. So I just tried to put it in one place. And I just want to say thanks a lot, Will, for having me on the show. Oh, I always love being here. I love talking with you and the way you perceive films. It's a lot closer to the way I do than a lot of the film critics that I know. And so, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I'm a huge supporter of Meta Egg and may, uh, may you, I don't know, may it be a, a great success. Well, I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, I've always appreciated your mentorship, um, and I hope we can continue this relationship. There's a lot of a lot of things I want to build off of as far as uh, uh, studying you in the future and 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 introducing to you, to the to the meta egg audience the insights that that your career holds. And I'm very much interested in in whatever you've got going on in the future. So uh, as this says, uh, Omi Juan Dahomey, AKA Beskar Batman says, thanks for sharing Will and Audros, and we will check out the podcast, meaning the world is wrong that you can find on Spotify or anywhere else that, uh, that, that, that dispenses podcast. Um, and well, again, it, thank it, you and uh, just, you know, we end every podcast with this uh, missive, and I'd like to share it. I think it's probably true of the Meta Egg audience uh, that uh, wherever you are, the world is wrong, and it's probably wrong about you. Cut feed. Thank you, guys, and thank you so much for the individuals who joined us in the chat room and during the live yeah, stream. You. I hope that everyone out there who might be driving to work or something tomorrow morning watches it later. And uh, until the next egg, we'll catch you later. Okay.